Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about fighting fraud in the trenches. And um, I'll explain the metaphor of why it's the trenches. Um, very quickly, uh, my name is Amir Shaked. I'm the VP R&D at Perimeter X, uh, where we do uh, web security. Um, personally, I like to think like the bad guy. That's what I do best. And this talk is also about giving you some ideas about how to do it yourself in your uh, in the organization um, in order to improve your own uh, security. That's the idea behind it. And uh, with that, uh, we will start. Uh, so let's start with the, um, with the incentive, with the why. We are talking about fraud and fraud in the trenches. We are talking about the fact that uh, websites are in fact the new bank, if you would like. Um, they hold all kinds of virtual currencies from, actually from real funds like marketplaces where you do buy and sell to coupons, loyalty programs and all of those things. Now the thing to remember that unlike banks which are heavily regulated and had a lot of policies around them on how you can use them um, as a bank, most of the retail websites are not regulated in that way in any sense. Uh, and in a minute, I'll also explain why, even if they were regulated, it wouldn't uh, be helpful for the business. And um, this makes them the, the relevant target or the most uh, sought after target today in the fraud ecosystem. And um, oh, by the way, if you do have any questions in the middle, feel very free to raise a hand and stop me and ask. Uh, don't wait to the end. Uh, I'd like to be interactive. So the problem with this is uh, it's uh, the consumers or consumer demand. You have a lot of these websites competing on the consumers. Um, they all want the same uh, items. They want uh, minimum friction in their experience. They're working with a website. They want. Um, they're lazy in terms of they're reusing passwords and credentials between websites. And, and that's a fact. That's a given fact. And you can say, let's change it. You can say, let's educate them. But that will not work with your business-driven uh, uh, metrics, where customers will just leave your uh, website and go to a different system. So anything from two-factor authentication, put, even putting a reCAPTCHA on your website, um, you have retailers saying it drives down their ROI. They don't want to use it. They're looking for different uh, solutions. Um, but that's what the consumer wants. And for us as security researchers, we need to understand that we cannot look the other way from what's the business. We need to take it into account and then work with it. We cannot ignore it and just say, well, we have solutions, better passwords, too far record authentication, uh, no password login, etc. It's cute but it will not work with most of the users that are actually paying for the service that you're offering. So with that in mind, uh, let's go briefly and talk about the underlying economy that drives this uh, fraud ecosystem. Uh, I'm sure most of you know parts of this, uh, so I'll go over it briefly. But it's a broken down system of, uh, of people buying and selling um, <clears throat> Uh, merchandise on the, I would say dark web, but not everything here is dark web. Some of it is playing out uh, out in the in the field. Um, you start with some groups that are very sophisticated, doing APTs, uh, stealing uh, databases or username and password databases from uh, websites. Uh, last week, I think something was published, like uh, 200,000 from uh, some fan websites, uh, just as an example where they didn't even distribute, uh, differentiate between the, they stored on the same table the passwords and the hash. So no security there. Uh, but you have a bunch of examples going up all the time. Um, and these are relatively sold at around $10 per 100,000 accounts. Now, I've, I've heard uh, sayings, interesting sayings that uh, some of these are fake lists. Some of these are uh, not already sold. Um, I cannot prove it myself. I have no interest in buying and selling those lists uh, to prove it. I don't want to contribute funds to those groups. But um, the prices they talk about, even, it's, even if it's uh, like between fraudsters fraud, uh, these are the, around these sums. And uh, well, the LinkedIn is a very famous one. Uh, like I think it was four bitcoins for at the time for the 167 million uh, accounts. And um, 
This brings us to the next stage. These guys are doing the APT. They're buying and selling those lists. Some of them are using them themselves to the conduct uh, the, the attacks. But now comes the part where uh, us as, as uh, working with uh, retail or uh, marketplaces, uh, that's where we suffer. Somebody else was hacked and now we have a problem. Um, and this part is mostly automated, and this is why I'm also talking about the automatic uh, fraud uh, as, as an issue, because we build our websites or our mobile apps to be easily tested and completely automatic in all the, the, on the, um, and, um, in the entire CI uh, uh, process, and uh, we simply make it easy to be automated for anybody else. Um, so, what they do is they sell it to the different vendor. That vendor then reuses those and run uh, an automatic attack, which I will see uh, as an example of how simple it is to make. Um, we've seen all kinds of success rates. Um, anywhere between half a percent or quarter of percent success rate in the ATO usually makes them with a positive ROI as, as an attacking group. Uh, but we've seen all the way up to 8% success rate, which is uh, an enormous amount of uh, accounts being uh, breached. Um, everybody know what's an ATO? Do I need to explain this? Great. Um, and then those accounts are actually used for the fraud. Now, this is the important uh, uh, aspect of it. The trenches is here. Uh, it's on the first step where they're trying to gain accounts to do any kind of fraud within the system. Now, if it's a marketplace, the fraud would be to siphon funds. If it's uh, most retail websites have like a, um, um, virtual currency or cashbacks, they can use that to buy things for free. And many users won't even notice because the cashback is like for 72 hours. You have 72 hours to use somebody else's uh, um, um, cashback. And, um, and, and that's the fraud. And the fraud part is usually conducted very um, slowly and very meticulously because there are a lot of fraud detection systems and you want to bypass those as well. Um, but that's usually the second step in the process, and let's talk about what we can do with the first step. So, uh, what are they impersonating, those uh, the guys running those attacks? Um, we see them impersonating um, both the website and the mobile app. They will take a mobile app or the website, it's pretty simple to do. Open the inspection on Chrome, see the post request, see the initial request before to see the CSRF token, and you can pretty much um, copy paste and iterate the entire process, not running anything uh, um, for real. And if there is some complication in the web, in the site itself that tries to defend, um, you can run uh, like a full blown uh, uh, browser with Puppeteer or something like that and have everything mimicked. Um, but what is interesting to see is a lot of shift to target mobile apps because even though they are native, uh, native code, um, they are a lot more um, strict in the way they are constructed and what they're doing when they're interacting with the backend. And it's a lot easier to mimic what they're doing and impersonate uh, the API. So if you can see the colors, I'm colorblind. I have no idea what color I chose. Uh, but this one, I think it's blue. Uh, that's the browser being mimicked in attacks over time. And the other one, orange? No? <laughs> Green? OK. So the other one, um, it's the mobile app. And you can see it's actually interesting that there is a lot more mobile apps being impersonated in attacks than uh, the website. Um, and something you need to remember when we talk about how to defend or detect those kinds of attacks is the fact that they are using different methods and impersonating different things. We can use that when we're trying to at least identify them or block them uh, as researchers. Uh, another one, which doesn't show very nice here, so I'll have to point. Uh, what we see here uh, gives a bit more perspective into these kinds of attacks. Uh, the bar or the height of the of the circles is how distributed is the attack the lower it is the less the more distributed it is meaning the uh, average number of attempts per single ip address 
So attackers will get a large amount of IP addresses when they're conducting those attacks. We will see examples of how we can get those very simply. And what you s was there a question? So what you see, um, if you're looking at the time series uh, of this, uh, these things, uh, we start with um, a site not protecting itself from these things, and it's mostly being targeted with large-scale attacks using very few IP addresses targeting their website because an attacker built his entire system around it and is then running a botnet uh, against those endpoints. Once that uh, website uh, started uh, protecting itself from these attacks, uh, in a relatively simple manner, like uh, enforcing volumetric rules on how many attempts per endpoint, uh, you see them, if you can see the other color, shifting from the website to trying the mobile endpoints of that uh, retail. And once that was not working for them, again for the same reason, with simple volumetric rules you can put on any WAF, uh, they drop down and to still large scale attacks, but a lot more distributed. Um, I think I have it here. Yeah, this is just one example to show you how distributed it is. Uh, over a time period, less than uh, 10 requests per IP over several hours. Uh, that will bypass any volumetric system that will try and look at it because it's quite reasonable to have more than 10 different users and passwords attempted per IP um, over several hours. So going back to here, what we see is once they were the attackers and uh, were stopped on the website, uh, on the web endpoint. They mostly t targeted the mobile, and we'll see why they targeted the mobile um, on another example. Um, but even though they're completely identified and blocked in these examples, you can see they keep trying. Now, the reason they keep trying is the endpoints are evolving. Uh, you're adding features, you're upgrading your systems, you're adding more uh, capabilities, they keep testing and trying the system, and if they succeed, you can see a large-scale attack uh, commencing very, very uh, suddenly. Um, mostly coming from uh, like a rent a botnet sort of thing. Um, you have, going back to the ecosystem of, um, of this economy, um, you have groups setting up botnets, also not a very complicated thing to do, but they're setting up a botnet and they're simply renting it out for people to use for all kinds of things. Could be DDoS, but we see a lot of them being used constantly for uh, account takeover and such. Um, it's just one example, we, we picked like a few endpoints and started pinging them to see what we have, but we see a lot of IoT devices, MicroTik routers, D-Link routers, printers, dead servers uh, in the system that were never patched. Um, and also interesting to see is uh, if you get to hear about uh, how um, ransomware malwares work with these endpoints, they usually not ransomware, sorry, um, like crypto marvels. They usually try to be the only one in the system because they want all the resources, so they kick everybody off. These ones don't, they don't care. They're sharing those uh, uh, endpoints. So you have multiple um, um, botnet groups sitting on the same endpoints operating at the same time uh, using the network. Um, and this is just to give a context of uh, the data and, uh, and how is, uh, the, the fact that these attacks are constantly being uh, happening. And from here, what I want to talk with you about is, I would call it the weekend test. Um, anybody here works as a security or even just as an engineer on a retail or marketplace? A few of you? Okay. Um, have you tried pen testing your own system to conduct such attacks? Okay. How simple was it? The smile gives it all. <laughs> um, so then we can test. Take your system, sit on a Saturday morning, take your weekend and say, let's see if I can conduct such an attack with the tools I have, with the means I have, and succeed. If I succeed, I'm a very plausible target for these groups because these guys are not APT groups. They're very opportunistic. They're trying to break a system. If they would succeed with your uh, web, 
a website, they will keep on doing it. If they fail, most likely will they will just move on. So in the sense, you need to be good enough or better than the next guy. You don't need to have the best security and the best solution out there. You just need to be better than most. Unless obviously you were, I don't know, uh, Walmart or Netflix, they will target you specifically. But if you're not, uh, you just need to be good enough and they will uh, skip you. So uh, let's do the weekend test. Um, I planned it as a real demo. And then after a bit of talks here with a few other lecturers, I decided to just show you the slides of how it's conducted without doing the live demo uh, in order not to expose myself to rules you have here in the States. So uh, we will go through how it is conducted with, uh, with the examples, uh, but I won't do it as a, live, uh, as a live demo. Anybody wants can come and ask me afterwards. I'll show you. Um, so I took a weekend test. I downloaded uh, like five apps from uh, the Play Store that are quite popular, both uh, where I'm stationed in Israel, here in the States. And I said, let's see how simple it is to, to build such an attack. Um, on all five apps, it took me less than an hour uh, for each one. Um, so the flow is, is as it says here. That's what the, these guys are doing. If it's a website, they're going to the website. They're finding the URL of the target uh, login endpoint. Um, if there is a CSRF token, and I'm saying if because, frankly, I don't understand some, why some websites don't have it. Uh, but they're out there as, still, uh, like very basic uh, measures. Uh, they mimic that as well. Uh, it's very simple to do. And then you need to set up your proxy list. We can see, we'll see how we can set up a proxy list very simply. Uh, you need to get the passwords you, need to, you want to try. And then what we've seen almost all of them do, and this is something you can use when you're looking into your system as into your data. Um, this is what they're doing. This is how they're operating. This is how you can uh, try and identify them. They rotate user agents within the botnet. Like if you look at the 1,000 IPs or 2,000 IPs, you would see a number of user agents being rotated between them. So instead of looking by the IP, try looking by the user agent, and you will see them all consolidating uh, into uh, different groups. Um, they're injecting fake headers, a very common practice in WAFs and edge security systems is like taking all their headers, doing a hash of the, of the keys, so they're injecting fake headers or manipulating them slightly and breaking those kind of signature mechanisms. Um, and they're doing a very low volume per IP, uh, very, very, very simple to do. If you look at the native app, and I'm focusing on native apps. This is not like a mobile uh, browser. Um, you need to get the app. You need to proxy it. If you're, again, think of it as an opportunistic uh, solution. You don't need to work very, very hard to do it. So you proxy the app. We'll see how. Uh, if there is a certificate pinning, we'll explain what it is. I'll explain what it is. Uh, they bypass it. If there is a CSRF token mechanism, we can fake that as well. And the rest is pretty much the same. Questions so far? OK, so just remember, this is not an APT. They're opportunistic. If they succeed, or if you succeed when doing it on your own system with these steps, then you are a target for groups uh, that are doing it as well. So can you see the code? No, right? So what we're doing here is quite simple. We're going to show them. We're searching for, let's say, product squid, getting a list of IPs, iterating over the pages from show them uh, on, the, on the examples we get. And then what we do is test if that squid, if that uh, proxy is uh, open for use for anybody. Some of them are authenticated, some of them are more secure, but a lot of them are not. And it's good enough for our uh, example. So we're just trying one by one, uh, going through those uh, proxies and going into our own system and seeing if we get the response and, by, and getting a, a legitimate proxy. Um, just to give you a sense of numbers, squids, uh, when you look at Shodan, you get a few hundred thousand requests per squid. 
or per uh, proxy, a lot of uh, available items. Um, but not all of them are actually working. So when I ran the script um, last night, and uh, I got, I think, a few hundred. I don't remember exactly the number. Um, I think I think they disconnected me from the Wi-Fi at the hotel. But uh, a few hundred uh, servers were uh, operating and, and relevant for use. And because these are servers, they're still out there. So you can still use the same proxy list today. And this is important because we are doing the weekend test. We don't want to break into system to get the botnet. We don't want to rent a botnet. And if we will use like a cloud provider to set it up, we will lie to ourselves because a lot of systems just filter that out. Uh, but this is a good way to get such IPs and, and run the test on your own. So we get the IP list. Uh, it's a long list. And now we want to do and, and get the, the login request from the app. So we load up uh, with AVD. We load up. Um, do you know what's an AVD? Do you need to explain this? No? Great. Yeah? So we load up an emulator. We use, uh, in this example, I use the latest uh, burp, but you can also use it uh, with uh, Charles, Mitman Proxy, Fiddler. It's all the same. One thing you need to remember to do, uh, it takes about five minutes. Just do it and uh, don't forget. You need to take the certificate of the proxy and put it on the emulator as a trusted uh, authority, or nothing will work. No SSL connection will actually work within the proxy. So it takes a minute of work to do it. And then you just run the emulator, proxy everything through the for our right? for our local uh, proxy, and we get a request, and uh, we see if the app has uh, any kind of uh, security mechanisms. In this specific example, none. There is a login screen in the app. We uh, I open the app. I'm trying to do a login. I open the legitimate account just to see the results, and then I'm trying to do the login. And it just works. Copy as curl, run the command from a command line, it works. Copy as curl and then run it through a proxy, works. In that sense, I'm, I've won, I'm done, because I now I have 800 IPs of a botnet, a uh, free botnet that I can just run uh, through them. Even at a low pace, I can run a few hundred thousand uh, username and password through the system uh, relatively easy because nothing actually checking any kind of uh, mechanism that you have. If you've done the test on your own system and this step succeeded, um, I really suggest you put up some security measures. Um, OK. Now, something that would be very common, actually, sorry, I'm going a bit, a bit back to the weekend test. Um, try to think of it as a black box. Don't use knowledge you have on your own system because it would be, don't make any shortcuts because A, they are not going to do shortcuts. B, if you use the knowledge that you have on your own system, you will most likely make the wrong assumptions. Uh, and if you try to do the shortcuts as an attacker, it will both, a good, it's a good education on how to operate, but also, you will uh, do what they do and try and bypass your own system. You will not fall into the assumptions that something is actually secure and working. I can ignore it. So um, with these two commands, uh, we very simply bypass certificate pinning. Uh, certificate pinning is when you do an SSL connection from a mobile app. You want to make sure that you're talking read the right server, or specifically somebody is not doing exactly what we have done. So you're checking the, with the certificate authority, you're checking the, like the subject or something like that within the TLS, and making sure that you're talking with the right endpoint. Now, there are several ways to bypass that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, two of them. But uh, it's a very good, simple solution. Only today, it's very common within the internet on how to bypass certificate pinning. But it helps with most kinds of um, simple um, men in the middle. It will secure you from like a Wi-Fi men in the middle and such, which is why it's usually good to use it. Um, so in this specific example, um, the app had a certificate pinning. It was a different app. So I didn't want to go and do the whole routine of patching the app and bypassing the, the pinning. Uh, I said, let's just load it up, uh, APK tool. You open the app. You see all the files uh, with the JD GUI, if you know it. You can just go and open the Java code and see the Java of the application. 
and just search for login. Let's just search for login within the app. Now this was presumably a secure app. Uh, there was certificate pinning. Uh, later when I inspected it more, there was a f uh, uh, long steps of checking that uh, it's a legitimate device, the CSRF token exchange and everything. And then came the login part. But the login part was on itself. So I didn't take any assumptions. I just looked at the code. And what I saw is a function called um, get logon URL. OK, interesting. Let's see the get logon URL. And what we see is they have a few items that they request. Uh, encrypted user ID, username, passwords, obviously you know, we know what it is. A get the base URL. And from that, I constructed the, the login request. Um, but I wasn't sure what's encrypted user ID. And I wanted to be um, greedy in my attempt. So I decided just to remove everything that I'm not sure of. And let's see if it works. And sadly, it does. Uh, all the security measures going up to that stage in the app were irrelevant because eventually when I'm doing the login request, it works on its own. Nothing is actually uh, pushed to the server to test if it's a legitimate device, if there is any kind of token, if the app was real. I actually, I didn't even change the user agent when I did it. It was with the curl user agent, and it still worked. Um, so this is a very bad example of how you build an app. You think you secure it. Um, and if you go by the specs of what was done, everything is by the book. They've done everything properly. But they didn't do any kind of security on the login request itself, essentially exposing themselves completely to anyone doing it. It took me less than an hour to do it. Um, some of you here will do it within five minutes. OK, a different approach. So I said, OK, let's take it a step further. Let's not assume it's uh, so simple. Let's take a different app that was more secure. They had more uh, measures around it. Um, and actually, I haven't done this in a while. So when I said in the weekend to prepare the demo, I said, OK, before I'm trying to patch the binary and bypass all the, even the certificate pinning, let's see if anything new is out there. And um, luckily or sadly, I found it. Even that thing is automated completely. You have tools like Frida and Objection for Android uh, researchers, where all you need to do is with one command, which is uh, obje Objection's uh, patch APK, and it does everything that you need. It patches the app so that you can load it within the debugger and uh, skip the certificate pinning completely. Um, steps that would take a security searcher that knows what it's doing a few hours, maybe took less than uh, three minutes because everything is completely automated, the entire process. Uh, and it worked beautifully. Uh, I loaded up the app, the modified app, uh, into the mobile device, installed it, ran it, and got to the same step that I was before. Everything is working. Everything is running. Uh, I can see the login requests. I can copy it as a curl. I can run it. Uh, no security mechanisms around it. And eventually connecting everything together. You iterate a few user agents. Uh, you iterate the headers. Um, it makes you s and you iterate uh, IPs, uh, which helps you uh, skip any kind of security, uh, a security uh, mechanism. And from that, you have uh, essentially owned the system in what you can do on an ATO. Now, there are several things that you can do to protect yourself, and there are more tricks on what the app can do in order to prevent it. But something that we need to remember, and this is very important, it cannot be client side only. The client eventually is in our hands. It is untrusted. So if your entire security concept is based on client side only uh, mechanisms, uh, you will definitely succeed within a weekend test to, to break your own system. It has to be combined uh, with something on the servers. So. Let's take measures. Let's see what we can do in order to, to improve our own uh, security on, on everything here. So first thing first, we need to secure the app. Um, certificate pinning, even though it's so uh, simple to bypass, still something that's worth it, still adds some kind of layer. Uh, you don't want to make it available for everyone. Um, some things that are really important to do and are really not done. And the reason they're not done is because 
as engineers, we build a system convenient to us. But when you try and break the system, you see it's also convenient to everybody else. So separating the endpoints, separate them as much as you can, by the way. Between the web and the mobile, separate them. If it's Android and iOS, you should separate them. If you're building an app for the American uh, um, um, customers, and they will use mostly iOS, and you expect very low volume of Android. Um, that kind of separation will help you investigate better what you see on the different endpoints. Who really uses your app? Because notice, I, I uh, breached the Android app, and there is a reason for that, because it's really, really simple to do. If I would have taken the iOS app, it was a lot, it lo a lot more work. Still doable, but more work. And this is also something that we can use when you're trying to secure the system. Take that into account. Who is going to use our system? Uh, obviously, CSRF tokens, uh, install IDs and such. Um, a few nice things that I've seen on some of the apps that were a bit more secure is they're taking an install ID as part of the tokens they're passing around. and um, if I'm using the emulator, I need to keep on resetting the device in order to get new install IDs, valid install IDs, if I want to be connected to the store, um, making my life a lot harder to do a large scale attack, uh, limits the number of uh, endpoints I can use. Um, and something that I really recommend you do is check if um, credentials that are tested against your system, whether they're legitimate or not, are actually haven't, have been either breached or used. Uh, Troy Hunt has an API on his website you can use. I really recommend. If you don't know, uh, have I been pawned website, I really recommend you go and read up on it. Uh, it's a great resource. Um, don't contribute to the problem, please. Um, even after everything I said about the consumers, offer those, us, that want to be more secure, the ways to be more secure, two-factor authentication, etc. Um, don't be those on the bad policies Tumblr. Uh, you should check it out. Uh, all the limits on the like uh, six characters, eight characters, etc. Very bad security. Anyone that understands cryptography will tell you that's very bad uh, as as a, as a whole. And you for yourself use password manager. Anybody here reuses passwords between systems? You're ashamed to raise your hands. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. So uh, to monitor uh, correctly, uh, I said it before, if you separate the endpoints, you have a much better approach in looking into what you have and what's happening on your system. Um, interesting things you can look for. Um, the versions itself. You published an Android app. It was the version 1.4. and. You since then understood you have uh, your uh, security risk. You improved your system. You upgraded uh, the versions. You see the trend of users upgrading, and then you have you see a spike in version 1.4, and it's not no longer in the market. Most likely, the way we build our system, separate teams, separate people looking at it, it will work because you're doing backwards compatible. And when you upgrade it, you wanted to make sure users can still use your system. So as an attacker, I'll just use version 1.4. It was simpler. I downloaded the latest app, but if it's harder for me, I can just download older and older versions. If they still go to the same endpoint, if it's still supported, uh, I will bypass the system. Okay? So this is something that's also very mo imp important to remember. Uh, of course, monitor for logins and spikes, I think, goes without saying. Um, one thing that was very interesting to see is I said they're iterating user agents. These are not necessarily the smartest attackers, the most sophisticated attackers. They go online and download list of user agents. Uh, so just look it up. Look it up on GitHub, look it up in the internet. You will see all kinds of interesting things. You will find the scripts targeting your own system on Pastebin because two people shared it between them and, uh, um, and it will teach you a lot about your own system. Uh, this is just one example, this microbot, something that's already like I think two years old, but uh, it originally had like one user agent and we kept seeing it coming up and we traced it back to the, the open source project that it's built entirely around running a botnet. Uh, very similar to Sentry MBA, if you know, only without the JavaScript, only uh, like a simple uh, HTTP request. 
And um, a few things you can do to detect these guys while they're doing it, not after the fact, is um, make sure one of the two things. Make sure they're running JavaScript. You've seen how I conducted the attack. The most important fact there that was that I was not being a real browser. I was not being a full-blown browser. I was being just like a, uh, what we call like a primitive bot, uh, uh, doing only HTTP request or HTTPS request, not doing the entire uh, website. So same thing goes for the mobile app. Use the latest version. Make sure only the latest version is being used. Track usage on, on all the versions, like I said. Uh, but you can validate it. Add all kinds of uh, tricks into your system and could be any kind of hash calculations that will let you know that it is really is the latest version being used on your app. Uh, very nice uh, uh, open source JavaScript library you can use to do like fingerprinting, the similar things to mobile. And one thing that's especially for mobile uh, really is uh, a, great, uh, a great way to protect yourself is the legitimate flow. Since an app is uh, constructed in, in, in a constant um, uh, flow of paths, uh, you can use that to understand if somebody trying to do a login is a legitimate user or not. If it didn't do the device in it, for example, if you have in your app or something like that, this is not a real app being used against your system. If it did too many requests or any kind of deviation from your own system and you built it, you should know what's happening, you can use. And they are opportunistic. Remember, they don't necessarily go through the entire flow. They don't understand if a token was returned that said, do the init three times, and only if it was done three times, you can uh, make sure it's a, it's a system. So these kind of things you can do in order to understand if this is a real mobile app or not. Um, and the last thing, it's also the last slide before um, I'm wrapping up, um, we need to do mitigation. So two things uh, I want you to remember from this. Uh, one, uh, if you're blocking by the IP, remember they are using residential IPs. So if you block IPs, you're blocking, eventually you're blocking potential consumers on your system. So if you, if you do it, don't do it indefinitely. Uh, and they also sense its residential IPs because it's IoT devices being used, these will be replaced. So you need to have your rules um, with like a TTL on them and, and, and clear them and, re and, and refresh them. And the second one is more of a conceptual uh, thing, which is really important when you do security. Uh, don't give the attackers the feedback loop and help them understand that you stop them. If for a legitimate login request with the wrong password, you say incorrect password. But for something you decided, like the IP that was blocked, because you decided it's an ATO, you said um, 401, for example, you're giving them a feedback loop. They know, they understand. It's very simple to improve your system when you have something to, to run against. Um, so the simplest solution I would say is, Every, every time a uh, login fails, no matter what's the reason, say invalid password. They don't know if it's just because the success rate would be a quarter of percent. So even everything, fa they expect most login attempts to fail. So if they don't know if everything failed because of that or because you identify them and block them, uh, they're in the dark. They will not improve. You can have better security on your system. Um, and something that we need to keep reminding ourselves not to give them a feedback loop on what's happening. It's true in all, in all accounts, not only in this case, but in this case, uh, we have seen that the more feedback loop you give to the attackers, the faster they can improve what they're doing and try and look for ways to bypass uh, a system. Um, Last slide for questions. Um, that's wrap up of, of what I said. Um, some of the examples I will load on my GitHub. If it interests you, you can ping me on the on my Twitter handle. And if there are questions, now is a good time. Hi, um, I'm just curious if you have seen anyone use, or if you think there's validity to using things like TLS fingerprinting or like tar pitting. Uh, the answer is yes and yes. <laughs> um, you can, that's like the, with the headers, like what I said about the headers, uh, TLS fingerprinting is valid. Curl, for example, has a very specific TLS fingerprinting. 
but you do need to look at uh, the entire information being collected, not only the selected uh, TLS, because it hides a lot of features behind it. Um, but definitely. Though there will be a potential false positive there, so it can't be used on its own. You need to combine it with other features, but yes. Any more questions? Okay, I don't see any other hands up. Uh, please give a warm uh, round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you.